Amina, you're in New York, but you're in New York State, right? You're in Rochester, is that right? In near Buffalo. Oh, Buffalo. Yeah. I get the, yeah. these com, like confused sometimes. I know that they're both like up north, northwest. Rochester is like Rochester is like 45 minutes away from where I am, so pretty close, an hour away. Yeah. I visited a friend in Rochester once, and we we drove up to Toronto. It's just like for an evening, and came back, and it was all closed. Yeah, away. it's Canada is really closed. There's so many little towns, you know, you can go to over there too. So it's really nice. Yeah, there used to be a ferry between Rochester and Toronto, like a long time ago. I I heard. Oh yeah, the Erie Canal before all that. That would really cut down a lot of uh. Yeah. Drive time, turn it into boat time, and cut it down. Yeah. Like yeah. Fourth. And where cool. are you, Jeff? I'm sorry. You're I'm in California, in, right, Dane? You're in California. Yeah, yeah, I'm in Oakland. Yeah. And where are you, Jeff? I'm in Brooklyn. Okay. So, yeah, and I'm, I've lived in, well, I've lived in various places, but um, within New York, I guess, in in and around the city most of my life. So okay. I, uh, I am woefully ignorant of upstate, which... <laughs> I'd like to correct. I'd like to correct at some point. I know. I know the sort of medium, New medium Yorkers upstate. Consider, the, yeah, New Yorkers consider upstate like anything that's past. I don't know. Oh yeah, Manhattan. no, I know. <laughs> yeah, because even when I lived in like, I mean, because I don't, you know, I mean, my I have family in like Westchester and stuff, and I mean mm -hmm. that's that's not really upstate to me, and I lived there for a while and so on. But um, but yeah, it's funny. Upstate is a very big. <laughs> it's huge, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I should have been. I was actually out in Oakland uh, not long ago. I should have. Uh, should have been to Yeah, it was. It was kind of a busy vi visit as far as socializing. So, yeah, it's extremely uh, transient. Uh, I almost said yeah. community. That's not really the right word. It's a yeah. extremely transient region or locale. Um, New York is more. New York City is actually more rooted compared to the Bay Area. I mean, you've got people there. They have something like an accent. Obviously, there's nothing like that here. I mean, maybe a hundred well, years from now, might be. But. This always interests me. Actually, the um, the way that in the Northeast historically you have a sort of range of accents of regional accents that's comparable to like England um, mm -hmm. because of yeah. the because of the longer history of, so for example, like, I mean, I lived in Providence for a while and yeah. I mean, Providence has a totally specific accent and then Fall River and New Bedford and Massachusetts have like slightly different, but related accents, but those are totally distinct from Boston. And then, you know, so, so there was mm -hmm. like a great deal of variety. And then my understanding is that Pittsburgh is the city with like the most distinct form of English of any, of any American city, it just has like oh, really, really different um, vocabulary. Yeah, it's called it's called Pittsburghese. Yeah, really. Yeah. So it's not yeah. so it's not so much accent. It's like different words, distinct words that they use. It's both. It's oh, both. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's weird. Pittsburgh, the one that's not like it's not like a major port city where you would expect like a confluence of cultures. <gasps> yeah, Pittsburgh is fairly deep. You know, from as far as like a, a settled North America perspective. I'm surprised uh, that happened there. I mean, I but then maybe being sort of like uh, somewhat geographically remote helped that help that work out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I yeah. Think so yeah, just what makes accents come up, and even you're trying to anticipate the trajectory of that, what it might sound like is total fool's errand. I mean, it's so so random. Uh, but it, but yeah, it often seems to me like everything from the Midwest out to California is like more or less the same. Whereas yeah. it's whereas like mm -hmm. within, you know, New England and and um, you know, other parts of the Northeast there are actually like distinct pockets. Although they've I'd say they've been significantly weakened, the the regional accents are they're die they are dying out. So Yeah. I wonder if it's fair to say that um like this part of the country will never in fact have an accent like we've known it because it's mm -hmm. just too um the conversation streams are just too overlapping now, and it's just you can't be isolated enough for that to to, to arise. Yeah. Well, unless we enter, you know, post-apocalyptic, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, breakdown of you know communication systems, and you know, then maybe we'll have a I'm new just, flourishing of accents. <laughs> I started watching The Walking Dead again, and that show is actually not only is it a zombie show, but it's like the 
the biggest like ongoing apocalypse show actually mm -hmm. yeah. yeah unless something like that were to happen yeah apocalypse happened but of course the zombie aspect is highly unlikely but it would just be a more banal uh, pandemic thing probably before it would be uh, <laughs> yeah um i was i was gonna ask but, you yeah. th this makes me think of um you you know you thought I think you should maybe discuss movies. So uh, a movie I just saw, which is not necessarily a good movie by any means, but it's sort of interesting to revisit, is um, the Apocalypse blockbuster 2012. Did, it, yeah. did either of you see this? No, I have not. I don't remember. It came out in 2011, but the movie right. called 2012. Because it was it's, anticipating like a very near future disaster. Because well, it, it was, it was when everybody was thinking about the Mayan the Mayan long count calendar and the 2012 oh, okay. apocalypse, but yeah. it's the film is a little bit light. You ex I expected it to be more caught up in the Mayan prophecies and stuff, but what's interesting about it is it's a very like early it's a very like early Obama administration fantasy of the apocalypse, um, <laughs> and so. I mean, I, I will, uh, you know, spoiler alerts, but um, I will give some things away. But the, no, the idea is that there's a there's a um, there, there's some kind of solar flares that um, cause the Earth's core to heat up and cause all of these huge tecton dramatic tectonic shifts that cause massive tsunamis and earthquakes and things. So you yeah. get to see this is a Roland Emmerich movie, right? So it's the same guy who did The Day After Tomorrow and oh, right, else. so right. so Love it's you, know, you get these big you know destru whole total destruction of Los Angeles, etc. And but the idea, what's okay? One thing that's fascinating about this movie is that it turns out that the fate of the world hinges, and this must be the first movie for which this is the case, hinges not on American ingenuity and technology, but but Chinese technology. So it's actually to the Chinese that everybody, that all the world governments, including America, have developed a plan, but the actual execution of it is left to China um, <laughs> to, uh, to rescue the world. So that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing yeah. that's interesting is it's, you know, you have um, Danny Glover as a black president who turns out to be the last American president because, spoiler alert, America is destroyed. <laughs> um, and so you have this kind of, I mean, what's weird is like on one hand, you it's very, um, the part of how it's very early Obama administration is you have this kind of dream of racial um, sort of comedy and solidarity where, you know, black, black and white characters there. Interestingly, there aren't really any other other races or ethnicities represented. It's like mm. you have you have a black and a white protagonist. Um, mm. The who are who sort of come together and manage to become the 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 key figures in in saving some rem some remnants of America thanks to Chinese technology. But then, <laughs> yeah. so it's like, but then, it's like but then but what's weird is that so you have like America's racial divisions being healed, but within this world of like Chinese total you know, which in which the future looks like it's like complete Chinese hegemony and domination. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, there's something very interesting allegorically about this whole concept. Yeah, it's like the uh, the, Ch the Chinese are just sort of like these kind of, I mean, they're not completely faceless in that movie, but they're kind of like the ongoing background generators of some kind of technical solution to our internal racial dynamics. But they well, themselves are not like racial players or cultural players so much, you know. Well, they help save mm -hmm. some remnants of like good Americans. So that then American can finally come together in racial yeah. harmony or something. It's it's very odd, but I kind of <laughs> want to go back to you and yeah, you know, like I I thought that was it was pretty ambitious and out, outlandish uh, disaster film because uh, about a, a little over ten years before that, you know, you had a, a couple of disaster films in the, in the late '90s, um, Deep Impact, and then Armageddon. Right. Armageddon was actually very mm -hmm. high, but it was basically a 2012 of its time. Deep Impact was a little bit more modest as far as effects and go, but I think they tried to compensate by having a little more of a kind of a human interest angle. Mm -hmm. uh, also a black president in Deep Impact. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Morgan Freeman, who's been the black president like every time. <laughs> yeah. I thought, I thought it was Danny Glover. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, um, mm -hmm. yeah, Amina, I read your uh, article 
earlier today about uh, that movie Safe. That's kind of a very getting very far from a movie like 2012. Oh yeah, but like a, a low key film. Um, 1995. Yeah. Korean War. Um, kind of timely. You want to talk yeah. about that? Yeah. Sure. Sure. Did you did you both see the film or no? Um, I did. I I just learned about it today. I added it to a uh, iTunes wish list. I, right. I well, it's so. You really have to watch it. It's really it's it's very interesting. You know, when I when I read a little blurb about it, you know, I thought, wait a second, I feel like we're going through that right now. But essentially, it's about a woman. So um, Julianne Moore um, was Carol White, right? Carol White is the character, and so what she does is she starts to experience some sort of allergies to fumes gas fumes first of all just being on a highway or sorry freeway i'm using the the new new york you know um, see there we go back to accents and, and language you say freeway in california right we say highway but anyway she's experiencing some of these allergies and what have you and and she just starts to go more and more inward and um starts to develop allergies to chemicals and and uh, and as she's going more inward, she wants to kind of live in this bubble and um, goes to um, she almost has um, like, um, I think, even like a, some sort of seizures because of, you know, the reaction to different external factors in the environment. And uh, as this is happening, she's becoming more and more isolated also from her family, from her husband and her stepson. And um, eventually she joins, goes to this resort type of place that deals with same people who have same allergies essentially to the world, right? They, they really are trying to hide away from the world. I mean, that's the subtext of it, right? So she goes there and it all kind of has a bit of a cultish feel to it. There's this guru there, right, who's sort of... Uh, yeah, leading them, kind of asking them leading questions, telling them leading things. And um, at the end of the film, which I thought was just maybe could have done a little bit more with it. But at the same time, it's sort of telling, I guess she moves away from the cabin that she was living in, in this on this. Um, I don't want to call it a resort. What would you call it? Like a health center or something like that. And she moves into this kind of dome, dome like structure, concrete structure. And it's basically a cell with a simple bed and one light and she starts to I don't know say I love you to the mirror right she's sort of proclaiming love to herself but ultimately she's isolated from everybody but she wears a mask right she, you know in the in you the know. film and she has a she also has an oxygen tank with her it gets so bad you know but obviously it's about the interior isolation mostly and I know he he okay. did the movie uh, Todd Haynes did the movie as a backdrop of the AIDS epidemic, what was going on at the time, but it's a very kind of minor subtext, I would say, in the film. That's interesting. So, so AIDS was taking on a uh, a somewhat pandemic angle, except that it sounds to me like it's you say it's interior. It's something that's more uh, internal than external. She doesn't have much objective scientific reason for behaving that way no i don't think so yeah i mean she lives a very privileged life actually you know to kind of she, she lives in a very to use that word right we all everybody's using it but you know she lives in a, a very affluent neighborhood in, in california and huge house and uh you know the, her main concern is whether the couch is the right color you know and goes i mean nothing against it you know what i mean but it, it's just yeah. she, she lives a very superficial life and she's really not actually challenging herself to live something more than that but i think she knows that something is missing so there's this kind of lack of joy about everything the way she relates to her husband her yeah. stepson really doesn't like her so doesn't like him either you know um so i think it's more of a the this idea that you're escaping the world because you think there's something wrong with the world but really perhaps it's just something that's inside of you um and the idea of safety i think is interesting to what's going on right now with with COVID, obviously, you know. Right around the time that yeah. that came out, 95, you know, Seinfeld had made that episode about the bubble boy. Oh, know. yes. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. You know, something in the air, so to speak, about, you know, like a kind of a, <laughs> a sort of a, a sort of reaction to um, d disease mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. other as, as vectors of that, right? Well, um, 
so a weird connection here. I mean, so definitely that's a really, I mean, that's a movie that I saw a long time ago and have been meaning to revisit for the reasons you mentioned. But a weird movie that I rewatched that's, I believe, from the same year or thereabouts that, I don't know, I feel like people mostly mention as kind of a joke, um, is The Net with Sandra Bullock. Um, yes! And it's um, it's oh. it's actually yeah. pretty good, but it's also, um, it's it's very prophetic, you know. Yes. Um, you know, you think of William Gibson's idea that, like, the future is unevenly, dis- is here, it's just unevenly distributed. So you have Sandra Bullock really as this very recognizable contemporary person, but in 1995 or whatever. And yeah. part of the whole premise of it is, I mean, first of all, it's interesting in relation to SAFE because it's about the other kind of virality, right? Because on one hand, she mm-hmm. her job is to go through software and find viruses and bugs and, you know, right. debug it, right? So, and but she works from home. She's never met any of her employers mm-hmm. or coworkers in person. Yeah. And in fact, when her identity is stolen, right, which is like the main thread of the plot, she um, she can't really, it, she can't prove that she's who she claims she is because nobody knows her because she's cut herself off entirely from the physical world and interacts with people entirely through chat rooms and stuff. So it's a really, um, it's an interesting pairing with Safe, I would say, because it's sort of a... <laughs> um, I absolutely agree. Similar themes, you know? No, I absolutely agree with you. No, that's a great movie. And I know you look at the computer stuff from back then, you go, oh, my goodness, the things that have even happened. But the whole idea of identity there and yeah. uh, and, and having having this online life, right, as opposed to real life and and what is this embodied self? I think that's that's inherent in the in the net. It's a really good film. Yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, going back uh, 10 years before that, like, you know who uh, comes to mind as a character who is, you know, somewhat prophetic as far as like a, a, a pr- working professional uh, who had, you know, cut off from everything but but making money and, and getting by in life was uh, Jeff Goldblum in The Fly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He, uh, he said he like he he basically farms things out to people. He doesn't really entirely understand what it is he's a part of, but he, he's able to work from yeah. his really one thing that was not prophetic is the idea of that guy having a loft that big in New York City <laughs> that you can afford. Right? <laughs> <laughs> of course, what he did for a living was so murky that maybe even now someone could do that. I mean, they're not telling you what what it is they do, but maybe they're I mean, biotech is very lucrative. So who knows? But yeah, yeah. So yeah, he was sort of like a proto Sandra Bullock in the net as far as like the isolated uh, knowledge worker professional or something. Right. But yeah, 1995 had a lot of uh, movies, sort of cyber themed movies. Uh, yeah. yeah, the next, Vir- uh, Virtuosity, which was really just kind of a, a tawdry, ridiculous action film. Um, with, uh, oh my God, Russell Crowe, young Russell mm. Crowe. Uh, he looks very, very different now. He's one of those people, uh, looks extremely different, gotten older. Um, but all Johnny Mnemonic. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, the net was the most down to earth out of them all. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah, I think so. Well, and then you also have Hackers, which is, Hackers, well, um, yeah. and with, you know, which is a very different angle on the whole thing, but. You know, where you you have some other really interesting um, sort of prophetic elements, particularly the kind of gender bending part of it, where Mm -hmm. you have all the these hacker characters are all sort of androgynous in some Mm -hmm. way. And they and so and it's really seemingly tied to the way that they've become so identified with these online avatars that they can kind of make and remake. And so, you know, similarly, they're their sort of presentation in person has become just this kind of playful thing that they can. Um, that that's you know not fixed to any kind of social conventions, and that they can just kind of, in a sort of folk Judith right. Butler kind of way, just turn into a constant <laughs> performance. That was um, eclectic, eclectic group, but yeah, there yeah. was the one character. I mean, they don't they wouldn't be as explicit about it as they might today by making identity like kind of front and forward. But the Hispanic character in that was clearly gay. Um, and uh, yeah, she had somewhat of an androgynous look. Uh, some, or not. Angelina Jolie. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I mean, they're they're really uh, so. The, and there you have this kind of. Um, I mean, it's interesting because in the net you just have this uh, this sort of murkiness of the. You know, there are these sort of hacker figures in the background, and then of course you have the again spoiler alert. But the irony is that you know it's actually the antivirus company that's like putting in the back door that facilitates the, the, um, hacking. 
Mm. So, so it's yeah. sort of the security that is itself the liability for that, you know, that's allowing all of these hackers to get in. Um, yeah, which, I was, some, kind of, some kind of romantic angle in the net, some kind of dapper British guy or whatever. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Because she, she meets him, she goes on her first vacation in years, and then she meets this charming British guy who yeah. also works in the same industry, but then, right. of course, he's not what he seems. Let's right. Put it that way. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, we're, we're, we're talking about movies that kind of touch on different themes today, um, but they're fairly distinct. We have, you know, the rise of, you know, like the, the internet and kind of siloed individuals who are still able to contribute to you know, ongoing uh, economic growth and GDP, despite feeling like you're kind of not doing anything. That's me saying what I feel. I mean, I'm, I don't sure. <laughs> not everyone thinks like they're not really doing anything. But I have noticed, weirdly, since uh, the pandemic started, I've felt unemployed, even though I'm not, just because I'm at home a lot. Mm. And like, after COVID, being home a lot was, at least for a lot of people, um, you, you know, that you were un probably unemployed. <laughs> or taking a lot of time off if that's what you were doing. So it's, it's an odd combination of feeling kind of just disconnected and you're not contributing to anything and yet you're still making money and paying your rent and it's just sort of unusual in that way. And it's strange and I, you know, I, I really think that what bothers me mostly is, is the fact that people think that that's the new normal. I, th I think a lot of the stuff, the whole new normal nonsense, you know, is is irritating to me. Like, okay, that's it now, and we're all going to stay at home. We're going to be isolated. And I'm thinking to myself, well, maybe you have phobias, and maybe you have some mental problems that you need to take care of. But the rest of us, you know, the society uh, that is healthy would like to actually encounter each other face to face and and have conversations and uh, you know do those things that are considered human um i'm sorry my tone is a little bit perhaps sarcastic but i i resent i absolutely resent the idea and reject the idea that uh we will have to bend or sh um shape shift into this into this world that's actually becoming increasingly non-human so I think the battle right now, for me at least, what I try to do anyway through the writing is to um, keep reminding, well, myself and perhaps others, you know, that we are human beings. And not, not, I'm not anti-technology, obviously. The fact that the three of us yeah. can have this conversation is great. And I really, you know, I, I love that kind of stuff. But these sort of deeply human things like encounter with others, the mystery of yeah. human relationship, right? you know, you want to get, get a, go away from that. I, I think that's, that's dangerous, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the, go, go ahead. Oh, no, I mean, the, the thing I'm thinking of is there have been all these, um, you know, these videos of the first college football games going around. Mm. And of course the response, you know, and personally, like I've never care. I've never really followed college football and don't really care. Yeah. And kind of lost my interest in sports years ago, but you know, I feel, um, I mean, <laughs> I guess the hatred I feel for the people who like use that as an opportunity to scold and to, uh, you know, because I think these are people who um, actually want to prevent anything like that from ever happening. As far as I can tell, what they want is a world in which it's impossible to like have large groups of people yeah. mm -hmm. in nope. close physical contact with each other, behaving joyfully and having a good time. Like they actually want, it seems that there are people who are influential particularly in the media, who actually want that never to happen again. Because right. it's not because it's not safe. I mean, it's the Julian Moore thing. Culture you know? war, the culture war angle to this is it's almost like the pandemic was the revenge of kind of the the sheepish wallflower, you know, who wants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, you, you can think back decades, you know, like it, art, like artsier types, kind of sensitive intellectual. I mean, I, I had roommates in the past and, you know, I remember at one point Sacramento was thinking of this used to be a, a thing in multiple cities. Should taxpayers uh, be funding the building of, of sports stadiums, you know, and, and uh, mm. my art your intellectual friends would be like, ugh, sports, you know, and it's like, you know, like, why, why can't it be like an, an arts center, you know, or something like that. And so that sort of personality, I feel like they might be having a, a, a sense of victory in this moment over the kind of like the, the, the tacky sports loving gregarious, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. even Cuomo sexual hands on. <laughs> 
that kind of person, you know, like the the real estate agent is in, is in battle with the uh, product manager for some app. <laughs> you know? And the product right. manager feels like they're winning and they, they kind of want to keep this COVID moment going indefinitely as sort of a to make a larger implicit point, you know. Yeah, it's very strange. I think also what you, Jeff, what you said, Jeff, about the uh, joy, right? That's really it. And that's just like Julianne Moore. She's joyless to begin with. So what I'm thinking is that a lot of the people um, are using this exactly to to continue this joylessness that's that perhaps existed, uh, this kind of asadia or an anhedonia, whatever you want to call it, existed already in their lives. And maybe it existed in the society too because of the technological isolation already with social media I think but to to keep you know it has become kind of like a, a moral COVID is like a moral judgment right so if you want to get back to a life that's full of life right then you will be morally judged because you do not care about other people and what have you and I really I think it's all nonsense